People entered the New World through a long series of migrations spanning thousands of years of time. Two important questions for American archaeology are when and how these earliest migrations first began and how many different routes were taken by the migrants. The early peoples to enter the New World were likely in small groups who lived a hunting, gathering, and foraging way of life. The traces that they would have left on the landscape would be very scant. Thus, the most ancient archaeological sites are few in number and very difficult to detect. Clovis culture is the earliest well-documented culture in the New World. As the map indicates, Clovis culture sites stretch across North America. The Lang Ferguson Clovis site, marked by number 12 on the map, is located in the White River Badlands of South Dakota. It was discovered due to mammoth bone being exposed in a butte face as the sediments eroded from weathering. the final refining bit. So now I've got a surface that should allow me to remove a flake from both faces down from the base down. But now I have to prepare this platform just exactly correctly because if the angle's just a little bit off, it's a little too strong or a little too weak, I'm really likely to break the piece. But even if I break it, it's not much different from Clovis because we find a fair amount of breakage in the archaeological record when Clovis folks were getting to this stage of the game. I got a bad spot right there. I've got to remedy. helped. Now once again, I'm making that same kind of a platform that I've made before. It's going to stick out a little bit this way and this way. And this is where normally I would use an antler to remove this flake. And I probably will try. I'm a little wary with this antler. I'm not real happy with the way it's been working. But it's what I have, so I guess that's the way it goes. All right, so I'm going to do the same, sort of grinding it, the same way I did with the side flakes. The one thing I'm going to do different is the way I hold it. Actually, I'm not. I'm going to do it the same. <laughs> Sometimes I hold it in a different way, but in this particular case, I think I'm going to hold it the same way, except I'm going to support it a little bit better. I'm going to wrap it with some leather like this and take that tip and stick it against my leg like I did earlier and then hold the side really, really well and then hit the base and try to remove a flake. This flake isn't going to go oh, more than an inch, inch and a half, maybe two inches if I'm really lucky. But that's what we see with Clovis. You know, a third to maybe sometimes a half of the way, and it very rarely all the way down to the tip, but that's not very likely to happen on this piece. So I'll just use the hammer stone again. And did something come off? Well, I got a, a flake that went about a third of the way. It kind of crushed it a little bit okay but it's not ideal and so to do the other side I have to just come back in here bevel it the other direction the base the other direction and set it up and then isolate that platform like this that 
platform sticking out a little bit. Oops, I over, overdid it just a tad. I'm going to change tools and techniques here to get a slightly more refined setup. Instead of striking the edge of the flint, I'm going to take this antler and press against the edge. It gives me more control and preciseness in terms of point of contact and and all. I can't remove very big flakes with this technique relative to what I can do by hitting. But it is more precise and a lot of uh, pieces were finished with this technique, especially uh, spear points and knives where you want a really sharp straight edge. They're not necessarily straight, but thin. All right, so I've set up a platform again. It's sticking out this way and it's sticking up that way. Uh, and it would be a really good platform if I had a good antler to strike with. I'll probably try it with the antler anyhow, even though it's, I'm not very keen. I think there's a reasonable chance I'll break it with this antler, but what what the heck? Doesn't matter. Clovis made things like this, broke them, and then they just start over. If it doesn't work out, you just don't worry about it and start again. On the other hand, that went fairly well. See the split came all the way up to this time halfway up the piece. So this would be a really rather uh, oh spectacular flute for a Clovis point. Now it's not by anywhere and by any means finished. I might even decide to work this side and come in and do the base again. But I showed you what I wanted to show you in terms of a Clovis technology. Uh, the finishing of the point is just a matter of poking away and poking away and and shaping it and shaping it around this channel, this flute. It has been widely assumed that migration from Asia resulted in new technologies once people were in North America hunting game in their areas. But some stone tool evidence suggests a European origin for Clovis technology. The oldest Clovis sites are in the eastern and southeastern regions of the U.S. and technologically, Clovis tools are most similar to Salutrian tools of France. The name Clovis is identified with the community of Clovis, New Mexico. This is where the unique fluted spear points of the Clovis hunters were first discovered, directly associated with the bones of animals of the late Pleistocene or last ice age. Pictured on the upper right is a Salutrian point, showcasing several technological features that are similar to Clovis points. While archaeologists know that people came to the Americas by sea and land, principally across the land bridge migration route now submerged under the Bering Sea. Salutrian technology offers the possibility that small groups of people also came to North America via an Atlantic Sea route. These migrations may have evolved into the culture that we know as Clovis. Once again, as the science of archaeology progresses, new theories are brought forward and tested against the ever-expanding data sets that are becoming available. As was noted earlier in our discussion, many human migrations entered the New World over thousands of years of time. The growing information about new world occupations keeps archaeology fresh and exciting as a field of research. Clovis technology was widespread in its period of use and led into several other distinctive Paleo-Indian stone tool cultures, the most well known of which is Folsom. Folsom points were fully fluted, the channel flakes extending the full length of the spear point. This chart presents the cultural chronology for the Paleo-Indian hunters of the Northern Plains. The Paleo-Indian cultural groups are replaced by archaic cultures, which emerge as a new lifeway approximately 9,000 years before present. While archaeologists cannot date Clovis technology or any other stone tool directly, we can use radiocarbon dating to determine how old stone tools are based on organic or once living material found in association. If a spear point is found embedded in the animal it killed, we can date that animal's bone, or if the tool is found within a campsite, we can date charred fire pit remnants, charcoal, or other organic debris. Archaeologists don't always find stone tools or other materials in association with organic materials suitable for dating, and in these cases can use stratigraphic and relative dating methods to get a more precise temporal marker. 
As a more complete understanding of the ancient Paleo-Indian hunting cultures has emerged, we now know that their daily diet was comprised of a combination of wild plants and small game animals augmented with occasional large game kills. The lifeway of these cultural groups was heavily focused on foraging. Lang Ferguson is classified as a kill and butcher site, which means it was primarily used for killing and butchering animals as opposed to campsites, which were used for residential activities. Kill sites are distinguished by their location, animal boat evidence, and the tools present. Mammoths were not the primary food source for Clovis people, although Clovis people took advantage of mammoth as a source of meat when they came in contact with injured, weak, or otherwise mired animals. Paleo-environmental reconstruction at the Lang Ferguson site allows us to determine that the landscape was well watered and that a pond or bog existed at the time of the kill and butchering event. The dominant vegetation at the time of the butchering events included dwarf willow, dwarf birch, sedges, and grasses. The best contemporary analogy would be the vegetation of the tundra in the high north of Canada and the Arctic. An adult mammoth likely consumed several hundred gallons of water and about 300 pounds of vegetation daily. Clovis hunters were tracking mammoth towards this marsh or bog at Lang Ferguson, likely finishing the kill while the mammoth was partially mired and not fully mobile. Pictured is the excavation of the mammoth remains at Lang Ferguson, which was excavated during a three-year span beginning in 1980 through 1983. The Lang Ferguson site was discovered in 1980 when erosion exposed a portion of mammoth pelvis in the south wall of a Badlands Butte on the Lang Ranch. During the summer of 1981, during excavation of the bone bed, the crania with tusks attached and the lower jaw or mandible of the adult mammoth were exposed. Recovery of the mammoth mandible with dentition allowed the age of the adult animal to be estimated at 36 to 40 years of age at the time of death. The photo on the right is a trunk's eye view of the skull of the adult. Pictured are the Clovis points recovered from Lang Ferguson. The tertiary flake on the far right in the photo was in direct association with the femur or leg bone of the adult mammoth. This flake likely was removed from a heavy chopping tool during the butchering event. A mammoth scapula or shoulder blade was recovered which had been bifacially flaked, meaning flakes were removed from both faces to produce a sharp chopping tool. Extrapolated refit of the mammoth scapula is pictured here, including the chopper tool and other fragments recovered during excavation of the bone bed. The chopper produced on the midsection of the scapula had flakes removed through bifacial flaking, thus confirming that the tools were being fashioned by human hunters and not natural forces. Numerous fractured bones, as well as a mammoth bone chopper or cleaver, were also recovered. These bone tools were being produced during the butchering event as expedient tools, allowing the hunters to process their kill without needing to collect more artifact material. A mammoth bone flake was recovered, suggesting that bone was being processed and flaked to aid in butchering activities. Fresh flaked bone produces a cutting edge equal to stone or steel in sharpness. A pointed mammoth bone tool was also recovered. This is a bone core produced from the tibia of the juvenile mammoth. The bone core displays the classic spiral fracture pattern when fresh bone is broken. The bone flake that was utilized for the butchering process was recovered in the bone bed and refits to the core. This is again direct evidence for the involvement of human hunters in conducting bone tool production during the butchering episode. This is an excavation map depicting the location of mammoth bones throughout the bone bed at the site. The brown bones do not show evidence of butchering, while the grayish-green bone elements demonstrate butchering activities. This diagram depicts the anatomical location of mammoth bones of the adult animal recovered at the site. Again, the elements colored brown do not show evidence of butchering, while the gray bones display butchering activities. The bone elements colored yellow were missing from the bone bed. The human hunters removed a segment of the vertebral column and split the pelvis to remove as a single meat unit. 
butchering an adult mammoth that had a live weight of between 16,000 and 18,000 pounds would have required massive effort on the part of the human hunters. It is calculated that the kill would have potentially produced some 5,000 pounds of meat. If the kill and butchering took place during the late fall or early winter, the hunters may have lived beside the animal, collecting meat that was preserved due to cool temperatures. The Naco Mammoth Kill Site in Arizona was excavated in 1952. The Naco site associated Clovis hunters with a mammoth butchering event. Clovis points were recovered within mammoth bones, and in total, eight Clovis points were recovered which had been used in combination to kill this massive mammoth. The Laner Ranch Mammoth's kill site in Arizona was initially excavated in 1955-56 and again further tested in 1974-75. The Laner Ranch site was a kill area that was reused by Clovis hunters. Two Clovis points were recovered within the rib cage of a young mammoth, as well as 11 other Clovis points throughout the site. The Colby Mammoth site was excavated in 1973. The Colby site in Wyoming has been interpreted as a winter kill in which a meat cache was constructed to be utilized at a later time by the Clovis hunters. Archaeological recovery of bone elements from prehistoric kill sites requires skill and careful preparation. Since the most subtle cut and butchering marks must be preserved for further study, the bones are protected by creating plastered jackets for their removal back to a controlled laboratory setting. Mammoth bone beds are especially delicate since the bones can weigh up to several hundred pounds each. Pictured above are a series of Clovis points from archaeological localities in Wyoming, including the Fen Cache and the Colby site. While mammoths did not make up the majority of Paleo-Indian and Clovis people's diets, when big game opportunities presented themselves, family bands would have feasted.